Hello everyone. Hear me alright? I'm trying out some noise gate filters on my OBS, which means less of my typing. Uh, if it starts clipping my voice weirdly, I hope you all are having a wonderful day. Um, it is lovely today here in St. Paul, kind of cloudy and windy. We had a huge storm last night. Watch. Oh, no, it's clipping me. All right, man. I'm trying, trying. Turn off the filters. Turn off the filters. All right, well. Hopefully this will be a little bit better. Let me just double check some things. Hmm. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't know. I just need quieter. Yeah. Well, okay, it should stop clipping now. Is that good? It's good. Show me a thumbs up if it's good. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Uh, my mic is, I can't, I can't eat it any more than I'm eating it right now. All right. Well, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our Tuesday design stream. You know, I don't know, um, what possessed us to schedule the Kickstarter the way we did. It all made sense from a distance, but I will say doing the AMA and then immediately jumping into this design stream, I feel like I am at a saturation point for myself. So I cannot imagine what y'all are at. Um, but I've been looking forward to this stream for a long time because, you know, I like doing the, the design chats with Patrick and we get to talk. Uh, but that always feels a little bit more like a show. Uh, whereas this kind of design stream is different because it's just me and the camera and my desktop and you. And we can really get in the weeds and I can do a lot of like showing and telling. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're going to get to that. Um, I have a bunch of things uh, that I want to get through. So uh, the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about early versions of the design. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through like a funny design problem that I, I stumbled over for just forever for a long time. And then I'll show you the back end a little bit about how the files work. And then I think uh, against my better judgment, I might just show you like what I happen to be working on right now. Uh, and we can do some some design together, and I'll just kind of talk about how how the the different design stages work. Um, yeah, this is big office hours vibes today. Um, we are in we are in my office. You can see my. I don't know if you can see. Let me see. I've got a little tree this way. It's a little fig tree, um, and then I have a I have some kind of weird creeper vine that my brother gave me. That's directly behind me. Um, okay. So, uh, first, before we get to it, I just want to say uh, a word of thank you to you all. We are the campaign crossed a million dollars over the weekend, over the holiday, uh, which is a huge, huge milestone. Um, and you know, I think I'll probably write something like about this, uh, in the Kickstarter update that will be going out tomorrow. Um, but those numbers mean a lot to us. Uh, we don't do uh, stretch goals or things like that. Uh, but our campaigns doing well does have a material impact on our lives. It means, you know, like the obvious little things, like it means that we get to keep uh, giving people raises and everybody does, does better at the company, of course, of course, of course. But also, um, it just helps keep the, the studio open. It helps us like buy things like a wide format printer, which we really need. Uh, and also, um, a campaign doing this well gives us options. So one of the reasons I don't like stretch goals for this company um, is because we sort of know what we want to make and we don't want to commit to any particular um, aesthetic or component upgrade until we really know we need it. So, you know, it might behoove us to say, oh, if we make a million point two, everybody gets double layered boards. But who knows what a double layered board even is in the context of this project that's going to change. So I would rather, as we work on the project, if we see that there's a need for a more expensive component or to spend a little bit more on the, on the production, we can say like, well, because the Kickstarter did so well, we have a little bit of extra money. We can spend it on those things. And that just allows us to make like better choices because I will tell you the trend of all of our projects is to spend a lot more on y'all and on the project the longer we work on it. So we always get our initial quotes. We do some of our initial pricing. And everybody on the operations team knows that by the end of this project, the game is going to cost a lot more money to make because I'm going to keep asking for things 
uh, and and then hopefully they're going to be able to give them to us. So the campaign doing well gives me power to ask for things for y'all, uh, and that is the perfect arrangement. Um, okay. Uh, can you tell if, if Patrick found the right printer? I don't know. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, is this the new office? This is not the new office. Um, we will be moving later this summer. Our new office, so we're in the Midtown on University, uh, the Midway on University right now in St. Paul, right on the edge of St. Paul, Minneapolis. And, um, uh, and we, we are moving a little north to kind of near the fairgrounds, but it's still, it's still in St. Paul. Uh, it was funny, I got a question in the AMA this morning. Someone asked me if I preferred St. Paul, Minneapolis. And I have to tell you, uh, not having grown up in the Twin Cities, I found this question like impossible to answer because I think about St. Paul and Minneapolis as being part of the same thing. Uh, and I could see how there'd be a lot of like, like it's, it's at the le level of like neighborhood pride or something. Uh, and so I love St. Paul, also love Minneapolis. Um, yeah, we, we get to be near to the fairgrounds, um, which they're good and bad things. Uh, okay, so can I ask about Kickstarter and GameFound, differences for a publisher, et cetera? So I will, uh, let me just say generally too, I'm happy to answer any questions people have in chat. Um, there are other things we, we, can, we can talk about, but I don't mind answering the occasional question. Um, Kickstarter and GameFound is interesting. Um, we spend a lot of time deciding which uh, crowdfunding platform to use. And I will say one thing about GameFound that makes like me uncomfortable is that it's just run by, it's run by another publisher. And we just feel like better about using an independent crowdfunding platform rather than one that's run by essentially a competitor. That just doesn't sit right. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff about GameFound too. There's a lot of good stuff about Kickstarter. I think both platforms are learning a lot from each other. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I can see, uh, I, I'm really happy, I'll just say as a, as a publisher, even speaking outside of my role at Leader Games, I'm really happy to see the crowdfunding space expand a little bit and for there to be some healthy competition. That's a good thing. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, we can't go any further north because then we get into the, uh, the territory that's already been marked by Asmodee. That couldn't be good. Um, okay. Uh, and then somebody asked about competing, completing all three sessions in a row. I've only done that once, actually. I usually like to play the first two, take a, few, a little break, like a day or two break and then finish the third one. Um, I think as we get the game a little bit more trim um, and a little bit more developed, it'll be more common for me to sit down and play all three. Um, okay, so uh, that, there we go, some little opening, opening questions. Well, let's get to it and start talking about the design. So I'm gonna try not to rehash things that I talked about in the designer diaries and instead talk about other stuff. Um, and I, I completely agree it is funny to think about competition. Although, I mean, it's, it's a good-natured competition, right? But this is mostly a question about, like, who owns what data, right? I'm not going to, you know, we don't, we don't want to share our email list with, with just anybody. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to try to not talk about things that I talked about previously, um, which is going to be a little tricky. But uh, I want to start by talking about a funny design problem I had right when we were first uh, working on this game. So um, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. My what you're not seeing is that I have two screens up, and my right screen is a real disaster zone um, because I have all these things I want to show you. Okay, let's get to that. So we can go to OBS and let me do that. Okay, so y'all can see Illustrator. As you know, this is where I live and think. Uh, this is a funny little object. This is the very first player board. It's four player boards actually. You can see them, you know, kind of in these like blocks. Um, and this was from the very first uh, version of this game, which was where we were playing Root. Um, and, and actually, at one point, I was using... Um, the reason these are, are like triangles, I was like using the, uh, the Ice House pyramids for the, the Stardox. Uh, and then I had... Uh, we were using a, um, a copy of Stitch Helm, an old copy of Stitch Helm, now republished as Stick It. For, for the cards to play this trick-taking game. And so I had them, the different colored suits, just colored here so people knew that their green cards were their build cards and things like that. But this is actually the very first asset I made when I had the initial idea for, for the game. Um, and then, um, so it started working and I liked it and I knew pretty early on that I wanted to um, build this as, uh, to include, to be able to hold a campaign game. 
and so I had I had this funny design problem, and I, this is the first thing I want to talk about because I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and then ended up just like not <laughs> using any of it, and that was um, this problem of map storage. So one of the biggest problems with for Oath, what, what, the central breakthrough that happened with Oath was realizing that you could store the cards in an array. So you could take all the cards in each land site, you could collapse them onto a single land card, then you could stack the land cards together, and then you could recreate this kind of two-dimensional array by essentially using the ones and zeros of lands and denizens. Um, and that was very exciting. And as soon as I realized that, so much about Oath started making sense. <laughs> Space mills, space mills. Um, so, so much started making sense about how Oath works. Uh, and so what I wanted here was a way to uh, have the same thing. I wanted some way to collapse the board. And so I initially, I spent so much time thinking about this, it was embarrassing. I wanted this dual two-layer hex where players could put their, their tiles, and then at the end of the game, the board, you would kind of... Um, stack all of the hexes together and that would create this like big cake you know this big stack of hexes of these two layered punch board where the second layer is holding the buildings in place so that way at the end of the game you could everybody could put their pieces back in their bags and then you could stack the board up and that would the board would hold all the buildings um and i really like this idea because it, it meant that the board could save its state very very simply uh, essentially, you would need two bags for players, uh, things you had built and things that you had not built, and then the board would keep the rest of the information. So then it became an interesting question of um, how do you store a hex map? Well, you can store a hex map by just knowing how many rows the island has. Think about Catan. Like if you have a Catan island, I guess I could show you this on the screen. You know, I get, we don't have to do it this way. But if I have a Catan island, you know, here's row one. Y'all, y'all, y'all have heard of Catan. You've played Catan, right? Here's row two. Oh, here's row three, etc. Right, and then, hey, look, everybody, it's Catan. Um, if you had a Catan I I island, what you could do is just stack the the pieces like this, and because you know the total shape of the island, you can know. Um, you know, the, the position of everything. But if we're playing a space game where the board is, like, growing in all these, like, funny non-Euclidean shapes, then there's no way to store this. This is, like, an impossible shape to store if you're stacking things together. Um, so uh, I created this really insane system. Uh, and I'll show it to you over here. So anyway, I, I spent a long time thinking about this problem of, like, how to store different maps. This is a, this file is called map and action fooling. And it's just me thinking about ways that the board can look and having some kind of like galaxy brain thinking about like different sort of like logics. I can't even remember how these worked, but they were like little logic. And th th this is uh, you know, this is classic, like how I use illustrator. I just have all these weird floating paragraphs. Uh, they're like, what if it was connected like this? This actually is like, um, when Patrick was working on Void Lich, this is a little bit how the Void Lich map worked. And so I was just thinking about, like, what is the Void Lich map? Um, and then, um, at some point, I came upon this system. And I, I worked on this system a long time. And the way this worked, oh gosh, uh, am, I, am I even going to be able to remember it? The way this worked um, is that basically the... Uh, systems had like three different colors and that they were, they could only line up in one particular way. I will, I promise I will give you a very good example of how the system worked. But the basic idea was if you were to draw a line, uh, the map logic, w you would trace through a specific line. And so depending on how the arrows were shaped, the board would like unfold itself um, and I thought, oh, that's kind of a clever idea. And I worked on that a bunch. And actually, I, I had this version. And this version basically says, hey, if you're in system A, so imagine you live in system A right now. Here's our ship. It's going to be yellow because I always play yellow. And it, it, it sits in system A. And if you're in system A, where can you explore? Well, you know there's an A system over here. Imagine this is a hexagon, so it's up here. Here's an A system. You know there's a B system over here, and you know there's a C system down there. And then when you go down to the C system, 
you draw a C, which is going to be over here, right? And so you draw a C. And you have to line up this C. Okay, I'm really explaining this poorly, and I'm glad y'all are here for the ride. I promise other parts of this post are going to be much more intelligible. Actually, you know what? This is a bad way to explain this. Uh, let me think about the best way to possibly explain this. I don't know if I can. Uh, yes, I'm making a directed graph. That's precisely what it is. So the idea was when you place the C system, or like, okay, here's the A, you go here to get this C. So what you've done is you then put a C system, and I, you know, I'm really wrecking this file. That's okay. Uh, I won't save it, I hope. You put a C system here, and then critically, on, in this little corner arrow, there's going to be a C on this side and an A on that side to show that these are linked together so that you know that as you're building the map, there's like a direction that it's going. Now, uh, this seems like raving lunatic chat, uh, but what it does do is it allows the creation of directed graphs, these like big two-dimensional shapes that can collapse into a single... Uh, a linear um, object, which are just like a sequence of things. And then as you're placing them, they're essentially like filling in the, this two-dimensional shape. Cool. Um, anyway, uh, I was really obsessed with this problem because I thought I can't build a campaign game if it takes a long time to pack away. And so actually I'll show you how this ended up looking because I went through all these usability trials and by usability trials, I don't mean anything as half as scientific as what Josh does, but instead like me just doing it in front of people and trying to explain it. But I basically got to this point where I'd say like, okay, this is an A. And if you want to go explore, you know that there's an A that lives up here. There's a C that lives this way. And there's a B that lives this way. And then if we look at the C's, you would like put a C down right here, for instance. And so now there's a C, and like now you know there's going to be an A above it, there's going to be a C to the left and a B to the bottom down. Um, okay, so anyway, these, these tiles formed the original map, and the original game had a lot of like exploring mechanisms. Now, what happened here was that I really liked this map because it, it built sort of like root-like maps, but it was like the root map could generate itself as you were playing. That's very exciting. Um, but... But I just couldn't, like, teach it to people. I, 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 it was one of those things, whenever I'd pack up the game, I would just have to say, like, eh, let me just do it. Um, and it was frustrating and didn't like it. Um, also, I just, I had a hard time thinking that uh, Kyle would ever be able to make this look nice. <laughs> it was just too weird. So, that, um, so I, that was a very funny place. Was, uh, this is, like, October of 2020, so we had just finished Oath. And I was working on this particular problem. And then what happened was um, I didn't know how to solve it. I didn't know how to solve it. And I didn't like what was going on. And so I decided to just like put it on ice for a couple months. I went to work on Root Marauder. And then a few months later, I started working on it again. Um, and you can see these files even labeled like Void Lich Playtest. Like I wasn't, we weren't even sure what, what this thing was that I was making. Was it going to be a separate game? Was it going to be Void Lich? Who knew? Uh, and then a little bit later, um, I started working on these different map concepts. And I was like, oh, like what if all the planets were in a ring? A ring's nice because you can have a ring and it can, it has a start point and then you can collapse it, right? But rings are funny. So like, for example, this again, this is like how I do some design thinking at the set where I'm like, oh yeah, okay, let's think about ring, ma ring maps. Advantages, easy to save. You get cool choke points, very clear game state. Disadvantages, too linear, too large. So if you think about like how far away is this point from this point, and you're like, well, that's one, two, three, four, five moves away. That's a huge amount of distance for a map that is 10 spaces large. So if your map only has 10 spaces and the largest distance between any two spaces is five or six, that's a colossal, colossal uh, difference. Way too much for the, for the kind of game that I'm hoping to, to make here. So I also, like, I created a version, uh, this is the shade map concept, which is like, what if I just stole the map from Oath? Right, that's good. Um, Anyway, uh, the, way the, the way this map worked, though, so I wanted something like Oath, but, you know, Oath has uh, the movement points that, you know, go from one to 
four and the movement changes depending on where you are in, in the oath world. And that didn't, I didn't like that because it was too, um, it was too rigid. And so I had this, I created this kind of stop sign system, which is as you built the map, you would have to, you would count your movement points by counting the number of stop signs that you passed through. Um, and so I went here and I was like, okay, I, I can move my ship like two spots. So I could move anywhere in here or I could move anywhere in here. That's two stop signs away. Couldn't go here though, because this counts as a, as a stop sign. And this system actually worked for a really long time. Um, and I, I even developed it into this like sub shade system where you had these like large shades and then within them you would have like sub trees that would, that would break out. Uh, and that was kind of interesting. And then we actually got this, this to a point. So this is now like the summer of 2021. So this is like a year ago. Yeah, this is what arcs looked like a year ago. Um, and I got to the point where it was kind of working. Um, but it, one of the biggest problems with it is it just didn't, uh, it just didn't create the kinds of like adjacencies and threats that I wanted. Um, and I was finding myself like missing um, essentially the old root board. So it was very weird, despite having like totally thrown away what, whatever was going on here. I like completely threw this away. I, when I went back um, and, and was working on this, uh, I was finding myself m missing it. So I went back and, uh, and, and built out a version of the game. Now, uh, one thing that I, ha ha I want to note here is that even at this point, the game was like pretty similar in some respects to the game that y'all know. So like here are the move cards. Now you'll note, for instance, that these only have two actions on them. They didn't have the scaling actions yet. Um, they also, the initiative value, um, for a long time there, there was a bid system where you had to not take the actions to play initiative. Uh, and that created all kinds of problems. Um, but, but there was a lot of some similarities here. We had some wild cards, things like that. Um, the hands were um, pretty severe at this point, and in fact, the game featured a really robust hand draft, where basically, as you were playing the hands, in initiative order at the end of each card play, you would start drafting your next hand from cards from a hand and a go. Um, so, like, th th there's a very interesting, like, planning game going on there, and I thought that was going to end up being central to the design, but it turns out that draft was a waste of time. Um, okay, so anyway, none of this worked. Um, but the action system worked generally in the map system I hated. Uh, it turns out this map system was good for Oath and not good for a space game. So I went back and, ooh, let me see if I can find it, actually. Uh, because the problem with, okay, hold please while I look for an early draft of the map. Are you an early draft of the map? Sorry, I should have queued all this stuff. Uh-oh, it's a game with fooling in the title. Oh, yeah, uh, okay, sorry. One quick bar. So I, I had abandoned the shade system. I wanted badly, so now I'm taking you all back, back in time to, uh, like, August, September of last year. Um, I, had, I had dropped this map system. I had gone back to the this one but hated it because it was too complicated. And so I, I thought, you know, maybe the system is complicated not because the idea is complicated, but because hexagons are complicated. So I made a square version. Um, and here's the square version. And I like, I, I put these like weird um, kind of like jellyfish uh, streams in it because I thought that helped made it clear like what things were connected to what. And, and it was, a, it actually was a lot clearer. And what this told me was that it was very important for the map to be connected in a way similar to a root map, but that the modularity these tiles were giving me uh, was just not needed. It was not good. Uh, so I, I got rid of that. Uh, and then, let's see if I can find it. Um, oh, yeah, here's a funny one I'll show you. This is... Uh, I'm not even going to bother to, well, I will. It's only a few buttons. There's, I'll re-rotate it. Here's a, here's a cut that said, what if we did Oath? <laughs> Where there's the core, the reach, and the rim. 
and, and all of these things can have different movement points. And you know what was horrible about this? Um, in a game where you're controlling more than one piece, uh, it's hard to count up movement points. Everyone hates that. It was just too mathy. It was so much simpler to have a root system where people just move from one spot to, an, to another. Um, okay, yeah, so I had this version. Didn't like it, didn't like it. Um, try doing interesting things with it. Uh, and then, okay, I'm trying to find the one. The big change. Can it have really been from that late? Maybe. Okay, so at a certain point, I basically said, hey, let's just build a root map. Um, and this, this was a kind of funny... Um, ooh, is it this one, though? There we go. Here it is. Um, so I said, what about a root map? Um, we could just make one of them. I've heard they're good. Uh, and I liked this because it forced me to ask myself very hard questions about how many spaces can the map have? How connected can the systems be? Um, all that kind of stuff, all those adjacency things. Um, and then when we were, pl and, and actually once I had this version of the map, it allowed me to um, rewind, not rewind, but it allowed me to redirect my focus on the action card. So basically I got this map and this is like September of, the, of last year. Um, and so I, I, got, I got to September, October maybe, I was working on this and said, okay, this is allowing me to actually work on the action system. And the, the way these, um, the way these uh, red spots worked is the idea is these were like hazard zones called voids, and you would put a random void type in them. And so this would be like asteroid field. And so it would tell you, hey, the, that's what the, the red spots are, this asteroid field. And then over here it'd be like, ah, this is the psionic vortex. And you put that card here, and now all four of these spots take that power, that ability. And you can hope, hopefully you can see some of the void logic here. Uh, but uh, so I was working pretty hard on thinking through, um, thinking through the, the, the design, the action system. We were talking, working on the, the campaign mode at this point, just kind of getting it all working. Um, and then. Uh, I realized a really funny problem. And actually, here, actually, before I tell you the, the funny problem with this map, I will say, um, sometimes I get questions about, like, what comes first, theme or mechanic or whatever. And I even get this question a lot. Someone told me that they didn't like ARCs because they felt like it was the first game that I had worked on where um, I was putting the mechanisms before the theme, and I was like, you just haven't ever watched how I've worked before because I, it's a conversation. The things are constantly cycling into each other. And so one of the things that we were doing right now is sort of figuring out, um, we were figuring out like what kind of stories can the game tell? You know, what kind of games can the stories make? And like th they're cycling in on each other. Okay, so working on this, uh, I, I noticed a really funny thing when we were playing this. Um, so players have ships, here's some. And so, you know, you got a bunch of ships. And what I was finding was that as a, as a physical game board, the board was both crowded and empty at the same time. And it was crowded and empty at the same time because all of the pieces were clustering at the planets because so much, um, so much was uh, taken up by paths. And like this path is not telling us very much information. And whereas Root, the role of the forests and of the, the storytelling of the map does is very important. In a space game, we needed space to have more presence on the board. So that then led us to um, the existing board. I'm just going to open this up and hope it's the right file. Okay, so here's the board. Hello, it's the board. And um, I will show you. What is that? No, that's not nothing. That's nothing right there. So uh, this board is actually an adaptation of the previous board. I can let me turn off some layers here to get you to give you a sense of what we're looking at here. Um, well, what I did was I just went in and I, I made a big hex field. So I basically like took these are the raw hexes. Actually, here, here's what we're gonna do. This is this will be a wild exercise. I have no idea if this is gonna work. So what I did was I said, okay, uh, let's get rid of the ships. Let's lock that, make a new layer, okay. Um, so what I did was I basically made a hex 
Oh, look at that. It's like magic because this is how I made it. Um, so what I did was I made a big hex field because if you want to turn a point-to-point -point map to an area map, the fastest way to do it is to make a hex field. And then what you can do is you can color in the hexes. So you can say like, ah, yes, I want all of these hexes to be one area. And then you hit this thing and you say, yes, join that into an area. And I want to give it a stroke for a, a boundary, and then I want to knock it out. And then look at that. We've got our first zone. Um, and so this is like the fastest way I know how to, how to, how to turn a point-to-point -point map into, a hex, into an area map. So I went through this. Um, yeah, uh, war game designers know this. But th the map that you have seen from the campaign stream is almost the exact same map as this map. It's just I put it into hexes. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I cut it up and everything. Uh, there you go. Uh, and, and, and that is, in fact, why they're hexes. And I, I was talking to, uh, to Kyle about it and said, you know, I kind of want, we want some kind of edge ornamentation here. I like what hexagons imply, but I also, uh, I think one of the problems with this is the hexes are actually slightly too large. So people assume they are hexes and not, uh, not just a, a border uh, ornament. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, let me build all this stuff back up. Okay, yep, so here, here, here's the map. The map for small rocks. As you can see, this is something that is a pretty ugly file that I, I pieced together and has nothing to do with the beautiful stuff that Kyle's done. I just stole these planets from him. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, all right, uh, so that's the map. Now, we then ran into a problem, which is we had a big campaign map. I'll actually go ahead and show you the campaign map. That's not the campaign map. That's a different thing. We'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, let me see if I can find it. Bum, bum, bum. Is it this file? I'm just opening random files on my computer, and we're just going to help. There we go. Here's the campaign map currently. Um, this is the current campaign map. So I had, then I had this problem, which is I had um, I had a lovely, lovely uh, campaign map. I knew how many planets I wanted. I knew how far away I wanted them from each other. I knew how I wanted them to interact with each other. I knew how many spaces, the adjacency of the, of the board. All of these things had been things that we were learning by doing um, pretty, uh, I don't know, pretty intensive playtesting right? Uh, but I had neglected uh, my initial problem. I just decided not to think about it, which is how the heck are people going to save their games on this map? And so to do that, um, we went, I went ahead and created an ID system for the planets. So planets have like a symbol and then they have a number which indicates their sector. So for example, this is sector one. It has all these ones. And then there's a symbol. Now, obviously, these, the, the, this is going to be a beautiful little thing when we're all done with it. This is just a thing I've bashed out in Illustrator. Um, and then, um, then if it's an edge zone to save Josh a headache, I just said, hey, the edge zones are the ones marked with a border. So if you're asking yourself, is this corner piece, does this count as an edge? And it's like, yes, it does. It does count as an edge. Um, so uh, did all that. And then... Uh, I made this thing, which is a campaign record sheet, which I'll show you. Bloop! It's the campaign record sheet. Because I had a hunch that actually the simplest way to capture a board state would not be taking a picture of it or having like a different, like a big table you had to fill out, but was instead offering people a paper map and that after, after offering people a paper map and saying, hey, Here's a notation system. Go for it. And so we have this little notation system here, you know, and you can use, uh, we, we might see about including colored pencils or we'll think of something else, but like, here's how you mark the different structures and then use tally marks for ships and you just capture the board state. And, you know, it's not that hard at all. It takes a few minutes. And then when you're packing up the, the game, you, 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 every player will probably have a small box which will have uh, spots for all their pieces, pretty nicely organized. And then anything that you have in play, you'll put in a little bag. So that way, when you get ready to play, you say, all right, don't worry about my player box, just give me the bag. I will put everything into play. And then I'll have my little box in front of me of my unbuilt stuff. Um, okay. Uh, all right. 
um, the, the problem with the wet erase version is, um, I have two problems with wet erase, uh, or dry erase. Both of them are not super environmentally friendly. Paper is actually a lot more sustainable than, than dry erase. And the biggest problem is you want these things to survive. And so because you're only using this in between games, I'm worried that a dry or wet erase is going to smear, whereas just pencil is going to get you a lot farther and we can in include a bunch of pads of paper. Um, and then someone asked me why two one triangles. Uh, that triangle uh, is used for a different thing. It's, it, it's coded differently, so th there can be two one triangles because this is one triangle edge and this is one triangle interior, so it has a unique name. Um, okay, cool. And so uh, this is a very long way of saying that I, I thought that we would have some kind of clever pack-up system. Turns out it was super expensive and confusing, and the easiest way to do it was also the cheapest way to do it, which is just give people a piece of paper. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And maybe, you know, this is the kind of thing that like, I don't know, maybe we'll see if we can commission an app to help people record their game states or like, you can just take a photo. It's not, it's not that hard. Um, and you can see down here, even if you've only don't have colored markers, you can use like, this is yellow and you circle it. And this is red and you circle it. Um, yeah, just a little, a little system there. Um, okay. Now, uh, yeah, the, so the idea is, uh, the, the game would come with a, with a stack of these. And I will say like, this is pretty far from final. Like we are, we are really at the beginning of a big, of a big journey here. Um, but it, it does work. And in fact, the reason why I bang this out is because I gave, uh, Dan Thoreau, um, a copy of the campaign game and we had only been playing campaign games on TTS, but Dan didn't want to play on TTS. And so I, I sent him a copy and then like a day later I said, oh no, I forgot to give you a, a record sheet. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to work on record sheets today. And so I spent a, I spent a, a crisp afternoon uh, <laughs> building out the, this record sheet and getting it to work. Uh, yeah, and of course, you know, you know, everything that we do is basically available for free as PDF. And that's just, that's just how things go. Uh, yeah, here's the campaign map. Looks good, looks good. All right. So next thing I want to show you is some of the campaign planning and how all that content works. Um, okay, so this is an interesting little like document that I'm thinking about lately. Um, this is a very early version of it. But basically, um, there is... One of the persistent challenges of ARCs is that uh, it has a lot of cards. So for instance, whoop, let me go over here. Let me see where this is. Okay, so let me show you a scary site. So this is the folder that has a bunch of the um, like images that we use in our arcs games. And the vault, which houses all of the campaign cards, looks like this. So here's page one. Let me see how this is looking on OBS so you guys can kind of see it. Yep. So here's page one. Here's page two. Here's page three. Um, these are, this is about 125 cards and it's all of the cards currently designed for the campaign mode. Uh, and so you'll see that they, you know, this is packet C9. Here are the cards associated with C9 behind it. Um, and then we have other cards too, which we'll talk about later. Like for instance, this is the seed page and you'll, you'll see that here are the seeds that are done. And then here are the seeds that I have flagged not done. The reason why I have them flagged not done, well, one, because they're not done, but two, because I want to hold their place. So when I finish a seed, it doesn't screw up the card IDs of, IDs of everything that follows. So I just have them have them held held right there. Um, so the, the, the problem with this, though, is when you look at the this card stack, it doesn't mean anything. It's like it, it, it's barely intelligible. It requires a lot of like leafing around to sort through. So uh, what, one thing that I have done is I've been searching for other ways of understanding um, arcs. And so this is, uh, this is actually the very beginning of a document I'm going to make that I'll be building out that basically is going to say, hey, here's like, you know, what can there be in arcs? Well, we can have unit definitions, global rules, blight behavior, alignment stuff, lattice stuff, map stuff, resource economy. And then as I work on plots, I can say like, ah, yes, resource economy. Uh, we have a plot that has an exhausted universe. We have the plot of the, of the cosmic worms. That, those play with the resource economy. 
we have this plot, you know, that's like, here's the confederation. It plays with the alignment system. And this gives me like a single page visualization of all the different plot lines. And eventually I'll go on and say like, ah, yes, like, you know, you should know that the confederation plot line, that's, you know, C8 or something. And I'll, I'll be able to slowly populate this chart, whoops, sorry, uh, with all the different system adjustments so I can see them at a glance. The other way that I've been doing this, and I'll make sure I don't forget, um, oh my gosh, what is happening? Oh, I see. Ha. Uh, we'll talk about the cosmic worms. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing then is um, I have this, this chart, and this chart is a place where I like, I, I, was, I was having a really funny problem, which is I could not easily uh, see what I was working on when I was working on this. Because, you know, if I'm in InDesign, I'm looking at one card at a time, right? Here's a card, there's a card. Um, and this is a fine way to edit a card, but my gosh, is it frustrating when you're working in like card packets of 10, just be like, okay, you need to cite this card. You need to reference this card. It's just this whole mess. What are you doing? What, what Josh, why are you, why are you, why are you mad? Um, <laughs> uh, don't worry. We're, we're, we're going through, a, we're going to go through a ton of, a ton of stuff. Um, okay. Do, do, do. Here we go. Um, uh, all right. So anyway, uh, editing a single card at a time, like this card, and J Josh knows what it is. Um, we are, we are going to talk about it because we're, we're doing it live, um, is frustrating because it's great at working one card at a time, very hard at trying to put 10, 15 cards into some kind of meaningful uh, concert, right? So that's not going to work. Now, when you're working on Oath, you can really work one card at a time because all the Oath cards behave by the same like logic. But uh, arcs isn't like that. So I made this chart and this chart was like, okay, here's the library of Babel fate. And one resolution takes you to the master archivist and that's going to unlock these cards. And if you don't, if you fail this, you get a random desperate fate. If you don't, you get the galaxy and Amber fate. There are all these things associated with it. Here are the side plots that kind of get built out. Uh, and I found this as an exercise immensely helpful because what it did is it let me see the shape of the game without having to just look at look at the cards um and i've gotten a lot of good use out of like sorting through these these plot lines um one thing that we do when we're uh when we're going through the, the design is we let me sorry i have to get this file up in the right place that's the wrong file uh-oh. Hold, please. I have a small computer error. There it is. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so one thing that, that, that we do sometimes when we're doing development is we'll open up like a TTS table and just lay the cards out in packets. I do the same exercise in real life. I just, I, I lay out the cards. I put them in the little packets. We, we ask ourselves how they all work. It's a little bit like if you, if you play Arkham Horror, the card game, if you're strategizing for a scenario you've already played through, sometimes you'll just like lay all the cards out in these big walls and you'll be able to say like, okay, how am I going to interact with those things? How am I going to prepare myself for that? Uh, and it, it actually, I think it's a really fun way to play the game. Um, cool. So yeah, sorry. Now look, y'all, there's nothing to be gained from zooming in here because these are all placeholder. Um, this is all placeholder stuff. Like, what does this mean? Founding the Senate? I don't know. These are just, these are all, these are all placeholders. Um, because I, I'm being a little sneaky with my world building and I'll talk about that in a, in a second. So none of this means anything. Um, and in fact, this particular plot tree is pretty old. Um, I want to show you actually here, let me minimize this Whoop. um, and go here. Okay. So I'll show y'all, um, all of the content that currently exists for the game. It's in one of these. This is, all, this is the whoop, campaign box and, uh, it's about this many cards. 
Whoop. Now they're sleeved, right? So it's like, I don't know, maybe 200 cards or something like that. And that is about two thirds of the, of the content. And this needs a ton of development. This is not done. It's just the, the, the proof of concept is done. Uh, and actually, I want to say a word about this because this gets to a very core, um, a very core thing about the design and development um, strategy of the game. So what we've been doing is essentially cycling between two proofs of concept. We've been cycling between the proof of concept for the core game and the proof of concept for the long game. And while that's happening, I am doing a lot of like actual world building. And what will happen is gradually I'm gonna start folding that world building into the proof of concepts so that when you, one day when you sit down to play the regular ARCs game, you're gonna notice that like there are some things that are very different about this particular game. It's gonna be a shift in the map, it's gonna be in the balance of the cards, it might even be in some core rules that are gonna start situating it within the broader story of the game. Um, and that's true for the campaign game as well. So the campaign game that we'll be uh, sharing with y'all later this week, probably Thursday or Friday, um, I, I would hope Thursday, um, is basically uh, a vertical slice. So it's all systems in operation for the full campaign game. It is not balanced and the content is not what the actual content will be. Like, for example, we have Cosmic Worms. I don't know if a cosmic what, what a cosmic worm or if it's going to survive but i do know that i like that idea uh in terms of what the mechanism is doing and so a lot of the the thematic work that will be in what you'll you'll see in a few days is just a placeholder um and then as we get through all of this stuff and the world building starts continues to get fleshed out really um then we'll be able to fold all that stuff all that stuff together okay let me go back to my screen now um, okay. Do, 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 uh, what? Okay, excellent. Hopefully, yeah, so, so the thing is, there are no, there are no spoilers. <laughs> there are no spoilers because n there is nothing to spoil. Um, okay, except, except for this. So, um, all right. Now, what I want to do now is uh, actually do some work with y'all, which is something I've always kind of wanted to do with the live stream, and I don't know, maybe we'll do it now. Oh, I didn't, I didn't talk about, I didn't talk about the um, cosmic worms, what they actually do. The cosmic worms, here I'll show you. Yeah, this is a literal design stream. Um, I just, I came back from a vacation, I'm uh, not a vacation, but like a few days off, and uh, I guess some people call them weekends, uh, and I feel very refreshed. Um, okay, the Cosmic Worms, um, they are, do, 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 boom. Um, so the way the Cosmic Worms work, oh, they're like earlier, I think. Uh, this might be too hard to show because of where these cards are sitting. Oh, here they are, Cosmic Worms. So um, the way the Cosmic Worms work is when you build them, when you get them to burrow inside planets, they start pulling resources of that type out of the game, and uh, you have to you have to you have to attack them to like unlock those resources. So it, it, it it's a riff on the exhausted universe um, system, but it, it gives it a little bit more aggression and granularity. Um, okay, worms confirmed. Worm facts. Uh, all right. Worm fact. Uh, worms have two tails. That's, that's not true. That's not a worm. That's not a worm fact at all. Um, okay, so let's do uh, some actual design work. Um, all right. So here's what I want to do. This is something I have been uh, thinking about for a long time. Um, I want to actually do like actual design work, and take you in a little bit to some of the design thinking. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to like flash a big. Um, a big caveat on the screen. I should have made a sign. I'm going to, this red dome looks kind of like a stop sign. So I'm just going to put it up here. Okay. So warning, everything I'm about to talk about might not be anything. This is just me doing my job and that you should just know that. Um, so now I'm going to start doing my job and I'm doing this because I really want to play, do a play test soon, but I haven't had time to actually get files together. So I'm going to get files together with you all to prep a play test 
which I'll be having with my wonderful developers uh, later today or tomorrow. Okay, so that's it. That's it. That, that, that's your warning, y'all. Everything beyond this point, it could be nothing. So don't, don't think about it too hard. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about the state of the design. Uh, I'm generally really happy with the, the core engine. It's doing pretty much everything I want. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the level of polish, everything like that. Uh, delighted by the Kickstarter campaign, uh, although it's been exhausting. Um, but there are some few obvious problems. So one of them is uh, the, 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 the core game is having some small problems with the victory point objectives, I think, and is also having some small problems with pacing. Uh, and basically, sometimes the different victory elements line up really beautiful and create these like lovely stories. Other times they don't. And I would love to find a way to, to give a little bit more sharpness to the small game and a little bit of uh, more narrative ballast. So we have a couple ways we're thinking about doing that. Um, and I guess I should say, uh, and I also, in terms of the campaign game, the biggest work that needs to be done right now is the generation of content. Uh, to that end, I'm doing a lot of world building. Someone in chat asked me what my world building process was. And I can tell you, um, something I will not be showing you uh, is I have, a, I, have a, I have a design journal document. Uh, it's quite long. I write in it just about every day. And in par part of that document, I have a world building guide that I'm writing out. It's about 4,000 words right now. Um, which it's not, it's not that long and it probably needs to be closer to like six or seven before I bother sharing it with, with someone. Kyle has seen it. Um, and it contains a bunch of things. So it contains, first of all, a section about themes, which is what is this world like about what, what, why build it in this way? Why is this a science fiction game at all? Um, and some general rules. So if you're building content in this world, here are some things you should know about how this world works. Uh, then it has a timeline, which is a timeline that goes back, you know, a thousand years, let's say, and tracks a bunch of history. And then what I've tried to do instead, which is a little different from how I normally work, is instead of um, just sort of describing the history of the world, I'm trying to embrace more of like a montage uh, technique. And so instead, I'm writing all these little fragments which could be like little poems or they could be little short stories or they could be like fragments of history books that don't exist, kind of a Borgesian technique. And I'm just sort of like writing all of those things. And what I'm hoping to do is when I give this to the other members of the, of the design team, when I give it to Kyle, it will give a sense of a really full world. Be and a lot of my inspiration here is coming from um, the history of Central Asia and also the history of the Fertile Crescent, and just lots of different elements of antiquity. I'm like really, really drawing heavily on that, and especially um, the limits of how we know what we know and where we don't know anything. Uh, so there's a lot of lies in these histories too, which is fun as well. Uh, but I'm trying to make sure that like the storytelling space that is being constructed is wide enough for a mountain of different types of stories to exist. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then I also have like a sense, you know, well, there, there's a section too that says like, hey, uh, here's the perspective of the players. Like th this game takes place in a specific year and here's who the players are. Here are the things that they would know. And so a lot of these fragments are things that the players would have access to. And so I'm trying to like ground a lot of the, um, a lot of the world building I'm doing in the perspective of the players. Um, and it does include some myth. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's that's that thing, and I I've been really enjoying it, and I think it's gonna it's gonna really uh, make me sad to destroy this world building document because I I don't think I ever want to share it or present it with any to anyone. I don't think so. I think what I'd like to do is really really build it out, and then it to be like a document that anybody who's working on the game has to reference and to add to. But part of the goal is going to be to hide the different plot elements within the actual like structure of the game, and I I should just quadruple um, underline this fact, none of that work has yet begun. That's like the next few months of work, which I'm very, I'm very excited to get to. Um, okay, so uh, that, uh, that's, that's where all that stuff is at. And I'm, um, you know, I'll say that like, I'm basically now in, in the place where I can say, I think I know how I want to situate the short game and I want to, how I want to situate the long game. I have answers to those questions. Um, okay. So let's spend the next half an hour or so and do some design work together. Um, all right. Uh, so to me, there are these two problems with the short game. 
uh, the standard game, the base game. I have to, I, I catch myself to doing it because I think the word campaign is so freighted. Like <clears throat> we're having a Kickstarter campaign about a campaign game that has military campaigns in it. So like I have, I have to constantly like orient myself about which part of this extremely large project I'm working on. And I'll, I'll say that one thing about ARCs, uh, even though the game is sort of simple in some respects, this project is much larger than Oath in terms of its narrative scope. And so th there's a lot of different access points into it. I have to be very careful about what I'm talking about. So let's talk about the base game. So I think there are two problems with the base game. I think, um, I think the base game has a problem with its narrative shape and its victory point system, where basically all the things that are happening with personal objectives, objective cards, final objectives, um, all those things need to be happening. But they don't necessarily need to be happening in exactly the way they look. And then the other thing with, with the victory uh, point, uh, the other thing with the base game is that the techs are a little slow. Cool. Now, we've known the techs have been slow for a long time. Um, some people have referenced Dan Thoreau's really excellent review where he talks about the, the techs feeling slow. Like, of course they feel slow. They're not balanced, right? Um, and we are working... Uh, <laughs> We are working on it. Josh, don't worry. It's going to be fine. Um, we're, we're go I'm taking people right into to, to the deepest end. Um, so the, the thing about that is we have taken the text through since Dan got his kit, probably two revision passes, and we're getting ready to do a third revision pass. So one thing that I asked uh, Josh and Nick to do was to hit me with their best ideas and to go through the text <clears throat> And, um, and to just kind of like put some edits in. So for example, um, these administrators here, now when you research them, you can build any number of them. Cool, right? You, they have like little burst effects. Uh, and then this, the Galactic Rifle is actually an edit of, um, this is an edit from Nick, of the Stronghold, where uh, Nick had the observation that like defense in the game was just more like what was less interesting than attacking. And so instead of the game, instead of it being the stronghold, which is a kind of interesting tech in the, in the campaign game where you often need to defend things, a galactic rifle was better suited to the short game. Um, what, one thing I'll say about this too is when I'm thinking about um, the short game currently, the, the standard game, um, I think one thing that I would like to do is build in something like a scenario adjustment, a scenario system, where I've got th this big history with about 600 years somewhat fleshed out <clears throat> of, like game, of world history. And I want to think about the base game as having these different scenarios which are going to be snapshots in time during the different parts of this long game. So like, you know, the year of the four emperors or whatever, right? Like that is a base scenario. And the idea then is that in every base scenario, players might get some starting techs. <coughs> there might be some special cards, like event cards and things mixed in with the market deck. There are going to be certain, like maybe even like light map configuration things. But that allows us to then have a, a lot of a really strong guiding principle when it comes to the design of more, con uh, more content. So for example, we know that the base game is going to have some kind of micro expansion. Right, and that micro expansion. All we know about it right now is it's more cards, and that might might seem like glib or something. But this is actually very important because we're determining the shape of a whole product line here, right? And so I want the maximum amount of flexibility. So when I was talking to the ops people, and they said, "Hey, is there you know does it make sense to have a smaller product line?" I said, "Yes, it does. I know it should be more cards. I don't know if those cards are going to be <coughs> just more things that get mixed in." Higgledy piggledy, or is it going to be like a scenario pack, or like the Exiles and Partisans deck, where you like select which scenario you want to play? And I think where I'm sitting now, if I can get the scenarios to work right, is I'd love for them for the for the base set to have like two or three scenarios, not linked or anything, just just different scenarios, and then the the small expansion maybe has one <clears throat> or two. So that that is what that is what what I'm thinking. Yeah, and yes, this is my war gamer showing. Uh, okay. Ooh, sorry, I ran, ran out of breath there. Okay, now, that's this thing. Now, I'm not worried about these cards at all. We actually already had a design meeting. We talked about them. Super excited to see all these wild blight farms. There's some great tech in here. 
Nick and Josh did a fabulous job uh, working on these. And I, I want to highlight both of them because um, I want to highlight both of them because I think uh, so much of the work we do is so collaborative. And I think I was hoping I would get questions about this in the AMA, but it didn't happen. Um, I really think about my job as being very much like a little director where I have, to, I have like editorial oversight and executive oversight, and sometimes I'll step in. But a lot of times it's just like coordinating the effort of other folks too. And I think uh, for these techs, we will have like design development meetings. We'll, we'll pitch techs at each other. We'll shoot down each other's ideas or, or we'll second them. And then uh, everybody will, will kind of fold them in. And, um, and it was so nice this morning. We had like a 10-minute meeting where I said, hey, I liked all your ideas. Why don't you reconcile them? So, you know, bring them together as best as you can and then present them. And we'll, we'll put them in a game that we'll play within a day or so. Um, okay. Now, one thing I'll say about the scenario design, which again, um, let me flash my like red dome here. Warning, this is not a final idea. I have no idea if this is going to work. All right. I don't know. Um, but one thing I like about it is um, when we're working on the campaign mode, some of the stories that we talk about are three act stories. And some of them are two act stories and some of them are one act stories. But with a single session mode, uh, you're kind of limited to one act stories. And w one of my, my governing rules is, um, one of, one of my, my governing rules when working on arcs generally is don't try to speed up when it comes to storytelling. So you can speed up text, that's fine. But when it comes to storytelling beats, if something's a three chapter story, the one chapter game cannot tell it. Don't try. And I think that is what gives arcs just a totally different feel than like tiny epic galaxies. <clears throat> and I think it's why arcs feels more like Eclipse or like some of the other uh, longer space games than it feels like some of the fast forward games. Okay, so we got these. All right, now I'm going to show you uh, how are we doing. It's three. We're good. I'm going to check Slack, make sure nobody's mad at me. All right. Good. Type a joke to Brooke. Um, all right. So now, 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 I want to talk a little bit about uh, victory points. So I have a wild idea for adjusting the game's victory points. I'm going to kind of show you how, how it works. Uh, and then I am going to attempt to actually build it into our dev branch of the game because we're doing it live. This is just like me, like this is the work that literally I would be doing at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, okay, so uh, basically um, I'm, the objective cards and the personal objective cards, I'm not crazy about. I think I like the idea of the final objective card because it gives players direction and if it's a scenario driven thing, so imagining a scenario says, here are some starting cards, some additional market cards, and here's a final objective. And that's like your little scenario pack. Um, and so I, I like the final objective because it gives you a target right away, but I would love, I would love to find a way to get rid of personal objectives and to get rid of, um, to, to get rid of the rolling objective market. Okay. So let's talk about that. Now, if I open up TTS here and I show you all the campaign game. Uh, if you watched the stream last Thursday, which I hope you did, it was fun, and I'm excited to continue it this Thursday. Um, we have, uh, you, you will have noticed that we have these bounties, this bounty board. And the bounties are set by uh, a player's uh, fate. Okay, bloop. Uh, so the idea here is if you're playing like, I don't know, someone who's jealous you put two capture bounty cubes. And what that does is it means, hey, if you take a card from my hold, for every card you take, you get two victory points. You get two power, because that's, that's where I'm at. And then maybe yellow has like three cubes on the psionic planet. And this one says, hey, at the end of the game, for every psionic planet you control more than me, you get three victory points, but it, uh, if you're not yellow. So I really like uh, the bounty system. Um, 
I think it does a lot of really good work. Uh, one adjustment we'll probably make even before Thursday <clears throat> is that this in-game bounty probably needs to be end of hand, an end of hand uh, bounty. Uh, but yeah, I, I generally really like it. Um, and one thing that I have found with the campaign game is between the bounties and the objective cards, there's like, it's just a lot. It's a lot to say like, okay, I'm going to try to pivot the most times while controlling the most Sonic planets and also capturing cards from blue. And you're like, oh, that's that's so much to, to worry about. Um, so I have this adjustment to the system. And uh, this is the part that will make Josh sweat. And remind, this is a reminder, everyone. I'm going to put my stop sign back up. This is all experimental. I have no idea if this is going to work. It might fall apart within 12 hours. Okay, cool. Uh, whoop, here we go. Uh, all right, so this is the uh, new bounty system. Um, and basically the, what it does, let me move some of this stuff away is, okay, let me actually, I can't even remember how this was built. Okay, cool. Easy. So, <clears throat> don't panic. I'm giving away the farm, Patrick. Um, all right, so here's how this works. Uh, in this system, there are no objective cards outside of the final objective. Instead, whenever you win a influence action, like here's this factory influence action. So let's say I win it. Okay, so like red wins it. Hooray for red. They won the all factory activation. Then for, for doing that, they're going to get one power. That's what the star symbolizes. And then see how it says purge one? That means that they have to put a cube from their stock so that they won it. Congratulations. And then they have to put a cube onto purge, which means you are other players are now getting points for removing their last pieces in the system. So basically the, uh, the influence actions seed the bounties. Um, so then like capture, for instance, if you win the like most, if you win the extractors, then you're going to have one go into capture, which means now people get victory points for stealing your cards. Cool. Um, and then I also have this wild power. Uh, this is a new element of the game that I would like to test, which is uh, activate a planet type. The idea is you pick a planet type and then you get to use all the factories and extractors, or rather all factories and extractors on that planet type are used for everybody. So if I say like, hey, I'm, I'm activating relic planets and I have, and, and then like Josh has one extractor on a relic planet, he also gets something. And then that puts two on, on relic planets. So now people are getting, you know, two points for, for that. Okay, so that's how that works. Then, here's a funny thing. Let's go up here to the top. So end of hand, you, you resolve your map effects. Then you score end of hand bounties. And then we have this one. And whoever wins this one, they get two points. That's a pretty big deal. This is two, um, this is two power uh, for winning this one. And they get to protect two bounty types from clearing. So like, okay, let me, I'm actually explaining this in a bad way. Let me re restart. So problem with this system is that it's dropping six cubes or more every turn, right? And so what you need to do is get rid of all these dang cubes because otherwise there's going to be way too many cubes after two or three hands. So what, what there is now is there's now an influence action which clears all the cubes, except the person who wins it gets to pick two spots that don't get cleared. So they could say, you know what? I want to keep hunt and purge. I want to clear all these other ones. Um, and whoever wins this has to put their cube on proud which is for each system you control more than me, you get that many points. And those can never be cleared. <coughs> um, this, uh, this system, by the way, uh, just to be clear for the, for, the, for the chat, this would potentially replace the, the rolling objective and secret objective system from the base game. And I think it potentially would be folded into the campaign game with the change that players who have starting bounties, they would use a different piece, like, you know, Here's a starting bounty piece. I don't know. It's pink. 
and that the starting bounty pieces, bounty pieces never get cleared. So they act like the foundation. Okay, so something like that. Um, and uh, cubes would not be limited uh, by player, nothing like that. Okay, so then, uh, so basically this should work, maybe. Uh, it, it, there's a funny kind of magic trick happening here because what's, what's going on is uh, at the start of the game, players will see a final objective card. And they'll see the final objective card um, and they'll say, oh, I need to like have the most ships or whatever. So they're going to like put some pieces here and win the all factory. But then that's going to start creating purge liability. Right. So these are always uh, so basically it like uses the uh, the signing bonuses, we'll call them these things up here to kind of prime the pump. <clears throat> and then as players play, it, it should, hopefully, if it works, generate a rolling kind of victory point incentives. Now, someone asked, what about the last hand? Last hand works perfect because, um, oh, 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 I see. What, what about the last hand for this? Um, what will probably happen on the last hand is we will just run through all of this, right? So, like, we're still scoring end of hand bounties. <clears throat> and then uh, you, we won't, we just won't do any clearing, right? I mean, the, 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 there's no final scoring happening, um, and that's and and that's and that's that. But that 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 that's like literally the kind of question that we're going to be sorting through here. But like, I, it shouldn't. The last hand shouldn't matter too much because the last hand is already being scored. We just don't need to score twice. Um, okay. Uh, do 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 do, and then. Um, the real proud is winning the final objective. That's right. Now, again, the objectives are not necessarily going anywhere. This may be a place they go. It may not. And for instance, there are some funny things here. Now, what I'd like to do is go through all the market cards and give them a like little bottom condition so that if you have a market card sitting right here, it will tell you what you get for acquiring the market card. So now every market card has like a little carrot that says, hey, if you acquire this market card, good work. Have some victory points, but also you have to put a bounty on hunt. Um, and what I like about that is that then that allows me to have wilder market cards, including having a market card that says, this is an active event. Like this turn, players can trade cards. Or this turn, players get points for every time they, they pivot or whatever. So some of those objective cards can kind of come back but they can come back in a little bit more of a limited way that can also be hooked into elements of the scenario design. Um, and that's, that's sort of how all that, that sits. Okay, so now what I really wanna do at this point is start designing a scenario because I have a lot of thematic work I can use. I have tons, I have like, I have three scenarios right now that I think would be good uh, matches for the base game. But I don't think I want to do any of them yet uh, because I, I have to make sure this system works. And we have a lot of like kind of things in the mix. So what do I need to test this system? Well, um, I've got the board done, more or less. I mean, this, this board is roughly playable with one exception, which is the market cards. So the market cards um, need this like small bottom panel. And... That's because they need to be giving um, they need to be giving bonuses to people who acquire them. So we're going to go ahead and in my next ten minutes, I'm just going to put in some small bottom panels, and then I'll run some exports, and we'll be able to see the game. Um, Turgid bloke, you're absolutely right. This system was directly inspired by trick takers, where you make bids on how well you're going to do, and then you have to try to match those bids. Um, so it's very much, very much inspired by that. Um, okay, so here we have our, our deck, and what I want to do now is um, add in this element. So again, this is going to be ugly uh, for the simple reason that, um, that it's ugly. There's kind of like nothing, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's going to be ugly because uh, this is just a prototype, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time making this broke thing look good uh, but what we're going to do is I'm going to um, go in here and my basic technique is going to be very simple 
and I'll, I'll I will talk about what, what I'm what I'm talking uh, or what I'm uh, what I'm doing here in half a second. My basic technique is very simple. Um, I want there to be a bunch of different uh, combinations of numbers of victory points and types. So what I'm going to do then is I know here that I've got, I don't know, there's 20, 30. I'll look at these. What is going on here? Oh, these are the breakthroughs. Um, talk, I'll talk about the, the breakthroughs in a second. But you know, for, for a testing game, I really only need the first 20. So let, let's say I'm doing this to 20 cards. Uh, okay, maybe even just 19. Okay, we're going to do this to 19 cards. And I'm going to look at my regime board. And I'm going to say, okay, I've got purges, hunts, captures, control, hold, and proud. Okay, so got those written down. And let's say market cards range from zero to two power. And let's say um, we're, we're going to have like a roughly even spread. Now, I, I eventually will want to manicure this. I'm going to want to very carefully curate this. Uh, not manicure, curate, really. I, eventually, I'm going to want to curate this and assign every one of these things that are appropriate. But for now, I'm just going to kind of be a little glib about it. And so I'll say like, oh, yeah, special forces, uh, that's going to give a hunt. Right, so if you if you bought special forces, people are going to be incentivized for hurting you. Administrators, uh, we're going to give this a purge. Right, and we'll say that this is. I'm gonna. I'm just going to dial it down. Whoops. Uh oh. What happened to my stars? There we go. Purge is going to get one. And then, like, this one is going to go back down to one, and it's going to be, uh, I don't know. Control all one. And that just means that they get one in every control category. <clears throat> that seems crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's Josh, Josh has the real story here that's happening, which is like, ugh. Um, Okay, and then New Galactic Capital, we'll, all, we'll say this is like Proud 2. Um, and then boop -ba -doo, Jump Gates, we'll give a Capture 2. I don't know. Capture 1. And the thing is, I'm not, I'm not doing like any real thought here. I don't, I don't want to. Uh, I'm going to do this one be a Hold... Hold, uh, we're going to say M and F. Uh, so that, that means uh, one point for every material, more than materials you have, one point for every fuel. That's actually a lot of points, so let's go ahead and add, add, add that star back. <coughs> I am not thinking too hard about any of this because I don't know if this design is, is going to work at all. Um, and so my main objective is just to get it, just to get it testable. Uh, oh, I deleted that that cutie somehow. There we go. Uh, all right, and we'll say we'll give this one a pro. Ooh. Uh, normally our files aren't quite this like. <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff going on in the back end that I can talk about, but I won't. Uh, okay, slipway extractor. Oh, this one's cool. Um. We'll give this one control. I don't know. There's like a few things that aren't quite working right about this, but I think we'll be able to sort them out. Uh, here we go. And then void siphoners. Here we go. We'll give this one a control too. Okay. Let's say 2P. That's fun. Uh, these have not been data merged. There are so many different types of cards in this game that a data merge is not as useful as you think it would be. Signal Jammers definitely gets a hunt. Hunt one actually sounds good for that one. Sprinters definitely gets a hunt. Maybe even like a hunt two. That's insane. Oh, well, let's do it. Boop. Uh, sorry, not sprinters. Sprinters should have a purge. And strikers should have a hunt. 
Um, and then Power Gloves, which is either the best card in the game or the worst, depending on which Discord you're in. Um, I'm going to give Power Gloves like a Proud. I don't know, maybe. Again, not too much thought about any of this stuff. Not worth it. Matter Converter. I'm going to give all these Proud because it's, there's a kind of symmetry to it. The, yeah, the, the, um, the stars are the victory points you get for winning it, and then the number is, is how many cubes go into the bounty. Uh, th none of this has really been thought through. There, there's going to be a like clean, probably iconographic way to do it. Um, ion engines can have... Um, here we go. Whoops. Uh-oh. Fuel. Hold fuel. We'll say one. Oh, oh. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm all, I'm all about like make the big changes. I think I think it's too easy. Um, where do okay? Oh my gosh! Why this file is hilarious. Um, there, um, I think uh, it's too easy to lose too much time making small changes. That's what I'll say about that. Yeah, I know. You could say hold F. That's fine. I don't know. It's, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not worrying about it too much. Um, do, 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 I'm like juggling two chats in a, in a design. So I'm not worrying about consistency here. Uh, super factories can get a hunt. Seed ships, let's give it a, a purge too. Oh my gosh. There we go. I don't know. Um, Hunter's Guild didn't get anything for a funny reason, which is not actually that funny. <laughs> um, <coughs> it's, it uses a different master page. Uh, bu 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 bu. okay, there we go. And they can have, they can have a hunt too, even. Great. That's broke. That's, nobody's going to want that. Uh, that's fine. Okay. So, uh, there's that file done. What are these hunt, per her told? Yeah, you should just go backwards in your stream a little bit. Uh, that, that'll tell you the answer. Okay. So now we have our, here's our new regime board. Looks good. Uh, I'll just do an export here. I'm going to save this as experimental regime. And I just want this to be page two. We're going to, I'm going to load this in my little branch right now. And then these cards are good. And there's this. And then I'm going to load up the TTS and I'm going to do this over here because this file is going to be wild and I'll just look at the chat for a little bit. Um, okay, while this is all loading. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the thing that I'm hoping to show here is, uh, you know, what we're doing essentially right now, this is like very classic game design practice here. I'll even, I'll even have straight talk with you. Boom, big face, big face mode. Uh, this is kind of like standard design practice. Uh, we have a hunch about something that's wrong. We build a, a branch to see if we can test it, and then we go test it. And normally I would not show you all into, like, into this world too much. One, because uh, even though it might seem exciting sometimes, it's also pretty boring. There's like just a lot of branches that need to get tested. Um, but I wanted to remind everyone that like ARCS is very much a game in development. We are constantly changing tons of parts of it. And if you want to know like, oh, how much art's going to be in the game or how thematic is it going to feel? I don't have a good answer for you outside of just saying like, look at the other games we've done. It'll be like that. It will be as thematic as those games. It will be as like crafted as those games because that's, that's kind of our whole, our whole shtick. And uh, when we're working on a design, one of my favorite things about working here is that I think we all feel pretty empowered to design the best game that we can and not worry too much about making sure that it like is only 20% different from whatever the, the Kickstarter 
whatever the Kickstarter was. Okay, so uh, let me get this over here. Uh, do we use source control tools for our branching? Nah, the projects don't aren't like quite as complicated as to demand those, uh, but sometimes it may seem like it's a good idea. Um, uh, what drives your brain the direction it needs to go to see? Uh, this, uh, sorry, this is a question. Whoa, sorry, I just started reading that. I'm going to read this question out loud because I don't understand it. Um, what drives the end game? What's the end? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends, right? It depends on the type of game that you're making. Uh, Arcs, for instance, is a kind of 60 to minute, so like a one to two hour game, depending on scenario and setting and all sorts of things. And so the, the game needs to like build to a detente by that time period. And, and so we can measure that time in terms of like how long does the average person take to take an action? How many actions are there in the game? Where do we want the climax to be? Questions like that. Um, and, and there's no right answer to how you build the conclusion of a game. It is so dependent. Um, okay, so here, let me take you. Uh, I'm going to get, uh, get, get my big head out of this and go back to here. Uh, this is the document that we use um, to make our playtesting kits. And what I'm going to do now is uh, just go ahead and make a new spread here. Uh, I, I just duplicate an old spread and then what I'm going to do is say, all right, place. And I'm going to go ahead and just grab this uh, file that I was just working on. And we don't need all 34 for our first test. Like there are breakthroughs and stuff in there. Um, I, I'm not going to worry about that. I mean, honestly, we will probably just play a half game and see how it goes and make adjustments. And then if it works, we'll play another half game. And if it works, then we'll play a full game. Okay. And here's that. Looks good. And then this is what, page 33, 4, 5, 6, 36. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and export page 36, and I'm going to stick it in the arcs kits here. And I know I'm not putting this in the right spot, Josh, and I'm sorry. Uh, but that's okay. I'll be putting it in the right spot eventually. Uh, but up bum and this is the experimental market. Okay, and we want page thirty-six. Okay, so that exports itself. Nice, looks great. Come over here. Now, what I'm going to do now, and this is a this is timing out beautifully because I wanted to be done in a few minutes, and we are almost done is I'm going to go ahead and just load up this. This is the, the public mod. We're actually pretty close to branching this off so that we can work without um, in, a, in a different mod from where, where you all are going to be able to see the game. But what I'm going to do now <coughs> is um, just go ahead and uh, pull these assets. Uh, up, 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 up. And I'll show you how I do this. Uh, one second. So we host everything on Dropbox because I really like Dropbox. And so what I do is I copy the Dropbox link and then I have to change the start of the Dropbox link to pull it as a direct link. Um, and that way, if I make an edit to this file, it will automatically edit if I, as long as I clear my cache. So here we just cover that up. <laughs> and then um, go like that. Bloop. Actually, let's go ahead and make this a little bigger because those cube spots are going to need to be big. Uh, and then we need the deck, and so I'll just clone this. It's fine. Actually, that's not a good idea at all. Clone this. All right, custom. And now I'm going to grab my experimental market deck, copy the Dropbox link, face this. Uh, and then uh, this, we're only taking the first 20 cards. And now, as you see, the magic trick. There they are. And it's all, 
It's all ready for testing. So this is the thing that I wanted to do this afternoon, but it was worried I didn't have time to do it because of the stream. And now I have, I have outfoxed my schedule. Aha. Uh, so now I'll just go save this. Um, actually, I can't save it because it will show you what other secret things I'm working on. And so I'll save it later. Um, there we have it. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, so that is it. Um, okay, so uh, let me just say a couple, I'll say a couple of general things. Um, I hope this uh, filled in some, some uh, questions or I don't know, something. It taught you something about our process, which is, um, you know, I think the, the thing that I really like about working here and working with, with the development team that we have is that everyone is really interested in making the game as good as it can possibly be. And there's just no sacred element to a design. I think everyone here understands that uh, the idea of the game, the like experience we have in mind, the story that like we want you all to be able to tell with your friends, that's the most important thing. And you know, a, a clever mechanism or a cute doodad that I invented or Josh invented or Nick invented, none of that matters more than the final experience. Uh, and so, when we're working on these games, we're always trying. Um, I don't know, we're always trying to find something that really resonates at a, at a, at a big level and, and, and not worry too much about what, what it's going to take to get there. Uh, so, and I'll say an, another thing on that, you know, some people have asked if we were going to be updating the Kickstarter print and play and things like that. And the answer will be yes, eventually. Uh, what we'll probably do is we're, we're going to take these these changes through internal testing for another week or so. Uh, if we like where they're going, we'll push them out to our testers. The testers will play them for a few weeks, and then we'll take them back in. We'll probably fold in some of the scenario ideas if the scenario ideas are working. Uh, and that might translate to a public release of a new uh, single session game in July uh, at, at the very earliest or, or a little later. Um, the campaign game will hopefully be getting a big, a big public release um, in August. I, I would hope. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing the kind of vertical slice campaign game uh, in the short term, but the larger campaign game will probably come out in August, and then that will give us time for a lot of public testing. But as we start locking down the files and getting all the art and all that stuff ready to go, uh, so these games take a really, really long time to make. And even though I think in some respects Arx is uh, quite polished and, uh, compared to where we are in Kickstarter projects. Normally, uh, there's still a long way to go, and we're all uh, really excited to be like kind of at the beginning of this really big road with everybody here. Um, okay, uh, with, with that being said, if anybody has any final questions, I will keep an eye um, <laughs> keep an eye on them. Josh, I want you to know that I did not delete the private objectives from the builder, just from the duplicated pages. Um, there we go. Okay, do 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 do. Just checking for questions on all the different medias. Thank you all for coming. This was kind of fun. Uh, it's nice to just be able to uh, to work with you all. <laughs> all right. Well, n no question. Is there a way of becoming a tester? Ooh, the, the trickiest question. Um, right now, we are not looking for testers. If you're interested in being a tester at some point, you can send me uh, a DM on Twitter or on Discord. And I, I keep a little list of people who I know are interested, and I'm happy to fold them in. Um, you know, it, we, and then the, the other way, actually, the, the better way is uh, we have a public li listserv that we can, an email list that we can add you on, and we sometimes go to that to get testers. Um, so we are always kind of looking for testers. But we don't publicize or anything because, like, you know, if for the immediate future, we have kind of all that we need. Uh, but if you are interested, just just reach out to me or write, if you write a note to support uh, at leadergames.com, they can add you to the uh, testing the, the testing email list. Uh, okay, gra gra. Thank you, Josh. Yes, the playtester newsletter. That is the best way. Don't send me messages on Twitter. Bless you, Josh. Um, where there'll be, le will there be less ion storing on Wednesday, uh, Thursday? There's no way to know. Um, and then Gragara, you asked, might you talk to whether you have discarded, uh, tie, uh, trying to find theme final objectives and running objectives together? Um, 
I don't know if they're still going to be running objectives, but what I would like to do if, if the scenario um, design system holds out is to link the final objective, the event cards in the market deck, which we now think of as breakthroughs, and then potentially some starting text, and to kind of bundle all those things together. Um, and I've, I have some ideas about that, and I, I would like to, to link them together a little bit because linking them together gives us so much more design space than making everything have to match up with everything else. Okay, cool. Well, that's it. That's all I've got. Um, if you have other questions, uh, I encourage you to look at the AMA that Kyle and I did. We might have already answered your question. Um, and we will be back uh, in a two days with the second episode of our campaign stream. I'm really excited to see what happens. <coughs> and also because uh, this is just a, a fun mix of powers that, that we have up. And uh, yeah, we, just, we have a lot more to share going through the campaign. I want to thank you all for your support. Uh, this has been an amazing campaign, and I'm excited for the next two weeks. All right, take care, everybody. <laughs>